questions at the end would be better um, and I can watch my time. All right, so um, the work that you're going to see is, is primarily the work of uh, David uh, Schaefer, who, um, let me just get my screen sharing going here properly. There we go. Uh, David Schaefer, who is now an assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh in Alfonso Silva's lab. Uh, Long-time collaboration with uh, uh, Professor Stefan Everling, who's a Western Research Chair here. Uh, Joe Gaddy, uh, who's our Managing Director for the CFMM and, and an Adjunct Professor in Biophysics. Alex Lee, who runs our 9.4 team. Martin Klassen, who's a, a Research Scientist. And Kyle Gilbert, who is also a Research Scientist and Adjunct Professor and, and contributes to the RF magic that you'll see here. So uh, for those of you who don't know, just a quick few slides of introduction to our facility. Um, our lowest field scanner is a 3D Siemens Prisma. It was the first commercially installed Prisma in the world. It's been upgraded a number of times since. Uh, our highest field human system is a 7T head only system, which is a, what Siemens calls a 7T MRI plus. It's basically a, a head only Terra system. Uh, it has a very high performance uh, head gradient coil, uh, eight transmit channels and 32 receive channels. Um, first installed in its earliest configuration way back in 2008. Um, and most of what I'm going to show you today is coming from our 9.4T. Uh, this system go dates back to 2005, actually, as originally a Varian uh, system. Uh, it has been twice upgraded by Brooker, first as a AV3 HD, and, and just this uh, couple of months ago, it's become a Brooker Events Neo, two transmit channels and eight receive channels. Um, it will get a cryoprobe as well. The cryoprobe is here in a box, so that will get installed. And about a year from now, we'll be installing a Brooker 15.2T 11 centimeter for mouse imaging. So for all you trainees who are looking for exciting um, postdoctoral opportunities um, in small animal imaging, this will be a unique opportunity uh, in Canada. And in fact, there's only one other in North America. So physically, we're, uh, one of the things that's interesting about our facility is that it is a translational imaging facility. Uh, we take that seriously. So our 7T is located here. Our 3T is located here. Our 9.4T is located here. And our 15.2T will be right in here. So it's all in one building on the same floor adjacent to our RF labs and our students and everything else. And this is really important because we're able to think about translation of the kinds I'm going to show you uh, all in one facility. So, you know, when you pick a model for neuroscience uh, research, which is most of what we do, um, you usually think about how similar that model is to, you know, uh, humans uh, in terms of their genes or their proteins or the receptors. Um, maybe you think about circuits a little bit, and, and maybe you think about behavior. The model really depends on, um, on what you want to emulate. So uh, if you want to study demyelination, for example, from an MRI signal perspective, you know, a mouse or a rat or a guinea pig is fine. Uh, demyelination is demyelination. Uh, you're basically looking at the pathology. If you want to study a model of MS as a disease, for example, then the longitudinal evolu uh, evolution of that pathology is important. And that, of course, differs between, you know, rodents. I mean, even within rodents, it differs between mice and, say, guinea pigs, guinea pigs being a better model. Uh, but even they differ a lot from non-human primates. Um, not because the, the nerve cells and the glia are that different, but because the immune systems are very different. And of course, in NMS, that's very important. So if you actually want to understand how disease affects behavior in the brain, then you need to be really careful about your model choice. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've studied some aspects of translation across uh, different model systems. 
and particularly at, at sort of crossing that meso macro scale organization of the brain. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with this definition, the meso scale is really the spatial scale that marks the transition between strong, what we call strong individual variation. So if you look at the single neuron level, you know, they're different in connections for any two animals and certainly between species. But when you look at sort of average atlases, um, like the Allen Brain Atlas or something like that, uh, those are you know, sort of preserved across multiple animals. And so that's what we call mesoscale. It's really the scale at which fiber tracks connect different brain regions. And depending upon the model system you're looking at, it's, it's anywhere from you know, 100 microns in, in mice to uh, centimeters in humans. It's basically the level at which you can resolve layers and columns in the brain of a mouse or a human. So the spatial scale, of course, varies um, in order to resolve that. So we've been using macaques for many years um, to study, you know, uh, homologies between, you know, a, not, a large non-human primate and, and humans. Um, and then about seven, eight years ago, uh, we really made a big thrust into looking at marmosets. So macaques have many areas that are difficult to stick oxygen probes in or, or um, electrophysiology electrodes or do optogenetic stimulation and things like that because the brain is fairly large. This is both an advantage, of course, and a disadvantage depending upon what you're doing. So we started looking at marmosets. Marmosets are about 300 grams. So they're, you know, like rats, which many of you are familiar with, uh, but they have a lysencephalic cortex, right? So it's smooth. That means, you know, all of the cortical areas are on the surface. This makes it easy for electrophysiology and optical imaging and optogenetics and, and things like that. Um, they're three to 400 grams, as I said, compared to 14 kilograms. They don't want to bite your head off like a macaque often does. There are transgenic models for marmosets. Um, they're highly social, so they're a great model in, in diseases like autism, for example. Uh, we have a breeding colony. It's very hard to breed macaques. Um, it's very easy to breed marmosets. Uh, and as you'll see, they're easier to study awake. Um, it's it's uh, hard to study an awake uh, macaque. So the important thing about marmosets is they have a granular prefrontal cortex. Um, the pyramidal cells in the, in, the, in the prefrontal cortex have a, a disproportionately high number of, of spines. Um, very similar to humans. So this gives these neurons a very sophisticated computational capability, which allows these animals to do very complex tasks, just like humans do. Um, and they have very complex social behaviors as well. Actually, they raise their kids very much like human parents raise their kids, for example. So I'm gonna talk about a story of, of how we sort of built a super marmoset imager, um, starting with an anesthetized MRI and then moving to awake MRI in these animals. So this is sort of the outline. So we'll start with our first generation. This was sort of pre-Brooker. Um, we were using 15 channel received coils um, and two channel transmit coils that fit, fit in our 12 centimeter magnets HD gradient coil. Uh, this was about six years ago that we started doing this uh, work. Uh, so this was all anesthetized. Um, so you can put a marmoset in the scanner and anesthetize, and you can image them for long periods of time. And um, you can look at their resting state uh, networks, for example. And, and what you see, uh, we've done a lot of this work in macaques and humans on our 70 scanner. We're able to look at homologies between the marmoset resting state networks and the macaque and the human resting state networks. And you see the visual network, the dorsal somato network, the ventral somato network, the, the, what we call the cingulo operculum network, the dorsal attention network or cognitive control network, salience networks, default mode network. These are all present in marmosets. 
This work was done by uh, Stefan Student Merriam and a postdoc, uh, Matt Hutchison. Matt left not long after this. Actually, he's now Director of Biomarker Research at Biogen. And you can map these at a very fine spatial scale because these are done at high resolutions uh, in marmoset and macaque. Um, so we moved on to, you know, sort of third generation holders uh, a few years later to start looking at homologies between rodent and marmoset. And we started developing all the imaging tools to be able to do this. Um, now I would say we're on our fourth generation of coils, but I, I won't talk about them uh, so much now. Uh, these uh, have body restraints, they have a receive coil, they have uh, some positioning control. And you have the preamps here. This is a eight channel coil, receive coil. Uh, you'll see some more details later. And that was for marmosets. We also designed these things for mice. So A, B, and C are for mice. D, E, and F are for rats. They're all 3D printed in-house. All this stuff is built in-house by Kyle Gilbert's group. Um, we use water-soluble structures so that we can have internal uh, cavities, so we can build in, you know, things like warming uh, pathways. Uh, we can build in um, anesthetic passage pathways um, and things like that. So, you know, we, you'll notice in those designs, uh, all of which are publicly available, um, all our work is, is, is openly uh, accessible and you can download all this and print your own stuff. There are ear bars and these ear bars are important even under anesthesia. This is, this is motion displacement um, of a mouse or uh, a rat actually um, with ear bars and without ear bars. And this is the rotations. And uh, you can see that, you know, if you don't use ear bars, uh, you know, you get significant displacements. Um, in all dimensions. Um, same for rotations. Uh, there are sort of these periodic um, displacements. Uh, with the ear bars, you're able to keep the displacements to, you know, under 0.2 degrees, and you're able to keep the motion to, uh, you know, typically we're imaging at three to 400 microns, uh, about 300 microns uh, in the rodents, and so uh, you can keep this to a fraction of a uh, of a voxel for displacement. That, these are 15 minutes of time. Uh, so as I mentioned, these are all open source. Um, we don't just have a bunch of nerdy engineers and physicists building these things. We actively involve our vet tech. So uh, Miranda and Cheryl have contributed uh, a lot to these designs because that actually makes them friendly from the vet tech perspective in terms of setting up the animals and the practicalities of animal handling, which is really important. Um, you know, you can design the best sort of things that don't actually work in real life. So when you image using these uh, coils and these holders, um, you know, for a mouse, we would image at 300 microns, a rat 400, and marmoset 500. So why, why do we use different resolutions? Um, these resolutions are what um, Matt Glasser and, and David Van Essen like to say, um, they respect the cortex. That is, at each of these resolutions, you get two to three voxels across the gray matter in each of these species. And that enables sort of the, the comparisons that I'm going to talk about. Of course, you could image at 300 microns in a marmoset, you could image even higher in a mouse, but to do the kinds of things that we need here, um, and I'm talking about functional resolution here, um, you don't need to go further. So, so what do we do with this kind of stuff? Well, we can study what, what we call the intrinsic functional architecture of each species. So what do I mean by that? So we do resting state fMRI. I'm, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with that. 
Um, the idea is you just put the animal in the scanner and you image them at rest, um, in this case anesthetized for, you know, 10-15 uh, minutes, you repeat that over and over and over again, you get time series from every single voxel, and then you can do various things like what we call hierarchical clustering. So conceptually, this is very simple. You pick a region, you pick a voxel, and then you look for clusters that are spatially close together and that have similar responses. So here you pick this one and you see these two voxels or these few voxels have a similar pattern. So you assign them to a given cluster and then you pick another one and you say, oh, look, well, these three uh, have a very high um, uh, similarity and we constrain them by um, uh, Euclidean distance for space. And you say, okay, so that's a cluster of similarly behaving things and then you know likewise so you find clusters of stuff that behave temporally in a similar manner um, and then you cluster them based on anatomical or cytoarchitectonic maps or their similarity to known cytoarchitectonic maps so we did that in this is marmoset um, we looked at large numbers of clusters we settled on seven because these seven clusters within what we call the lateral frontal cortex overlap well with known cytoarchitectonic areas. And then once you have these seven areas, you can use each area as a seed and you can um, compare, you can see where they connect to, but you can also compare them across species. So this is the marmoset. Um, there's a one centimeter scale bar for reference. So we have seven clusters. We can compare those with the exact same clusters obtained earlier in the macaque, as well as from electrophysiologic recordings uh, in uh, humans, for example. So as I said, you can use each area as a seed. And so if you use this area as a seed, this is the area of the cortex it connects to. So we do resting state functional conductivity. If you use this area as a seed, well, this is the area of the cortex. And so you can actually look at the cortical connectivity of each of these areas. So remember, we're looking at lateral uh, prefrontal cortex and its connectivity to the rest of the cortex. You can, of course, do that in the subcortical areas as well. So you use these areas as a seed and you see where it connects to in the deep brain structures. Okay. So now you can start looking at this across species in some way. So now I'm switching to the medial frontal cortex uh, to examine its functional similarity across species. Uh, this is done in the rat, in the marmoset, and in the human. So the first thing you have to do is, is decide on how many clusters you're going to do. This is always a little bit arbitrary. Uh, we looked at clusters, uh, hierarchical clusters from two to five. Um, we always look at what is known from um, atlases like the Paxinos atlas and so on. Uh, this is the human Paxinos atlas, the rat Paxinos atlas, and the mouse Paxinos atlas. And we settled on four clusters in this case. So we have them kind of curving around uh, the cingulate. Uh, from uh, area 25, area 24, and, and moving all the way across. So that's in humans, uh, this is in marmoset, and this is in rat. And when you look at that, you go, well, actually that's pretty promising. The medial frontal cortex in all three species looks uh, somewhat similar, uh, very similar aerial boundaries that map onto these cytoarchitectonic areas. So does that mean that rodents are a good model for human uh, function? frontal cortex circuitry? Well, you have to look a little deeper, really. So what you want to do is look at those areas, which we would say are very similar across the species, but then look at their connectivity with respect to the rest of the brain. So we picked seven different brain areas, uh, auditory cortex, striatum, insula, amygdala, primary motor, primary sensor, and posterior parietal cortex. You could pick any and other areas. Uh, we're trying to make this a tractable problem to start. 
Um, so you, for each one of the time series and the resting state from each of these clusters, we can then examine the strength of the functional connectivity to any, er, you know, these seven areas. Um, and you can display that as a fingerprint in uh, heptagonal coordinates. So each of these is a, this is cluster one. So cluster one uh, and its connectivity to all these different um, areas in rat, marmoset, and human. So we're not just looking at the aerial boundaries, but we're looking at the similarity of the connections between those areas and other areas of the cortex. So that's really important. Uh, you can compare these using all kinds of metrics. We use something similar, cosine similarity. Uh, you can look at it in matrix form as well for the functional connectivity. Um, I'll just, you know, this is a complex figure, but I'll just highlight one thing. So this is cluster one, two, three, and four in the marmoset. So here they are, one, two, three, and four. And how similar the, the, the connectivity to the same seven areas we picked uh, are in to humans. So you can see that the human cluster four doesn't really map very strongly to any of the marmoset medial frontal cortex areas, but for human clusters one, two, and three actually do. So there's a high degree of homology in those. If you look in the rat, eh, you know, cluster one is pretty good. Um, Cluster one in the human maps well to the rat, but not a whole lot else. So, you know, it's not too bad in, in, in two and three. So you can see that, you know, depending upon the question you ask, and especially if it's a deep neuroscience question, uh, rats aren't necessarily going to be the best, best model because even though they have the same areas, they don't connect to other areas the same way. So that's an important point. I won't belabor that. You know, so in rodents, um, you know, we have this argument all the time, good naturedly in, in our lab, because we, we do, we have lots of mice collaborators. Um, we often argue that mice don't have a prefrontal cortex, um, not in the same way, but, you know, it depends on how you define them. Mice can do tasks that in humans, we would say humans are using the pre their prefrontal cortex. So the real question is, how do mice do the task and what structures are they using? Um, and if you look in the literature, you know, it kind of depends on how you define um, prefrontal cortex. You know, if you define it in terms of pharmacological terms, you get sort of a different answer than if you define it in terms of anatomic terms. And it depends on whether you define them in disease terms or psychological constructs, you know, et cetera. Uh, so everybody's got their own definitions. So you can also ask something like, does the rat medial frontal cortex connectivity look like the primate lateral frontal cortex? Because what happens in the rat is it's actually medial and then it wraps around the, um, the uh, lateral surface of the brain. While in, in humans and in, maca in macaques and in marmosets, it's really on the medial surface. So you can start looking at this equivalence. Um, and what you see is that if you look at the medial frontal cortex clusters, C1 through C3, uh, actually pretty good similarity between humans and marmosets. Not so much in, in the rat. Um, and same for, um, for humans. So, I mean, this is the similarity across species, a marmoset similarity uh, against humans. So again, the important thing is, even if the areas are preserved, the connectivity is not necessarily preserved. And that's an important factor when, when you're interested in, in using these species for advanced neuroscience models. So, I mean, if you wanna summarize this, um, there is remarkable similarity in the topographical organization, the spatial organization of medial frontal cortex across species. 
but there are very clear differences between rodent and primate medial from medial frontal cortex in terms of the whole brain connectivity. So in the rat brain, the medial frontal clusters show actually very preferential connectivity with primary motor and sensory regions, while as the medial frontal cortex clusters in marmosets and humans show much broader cortical connectivity. So the brains are not equivalent depending upon what, what model you are looking at. So all that was done under anesthesia. And then uh, Yuki Hori, who was a postdoc in our lab, is now a um, professor at the University of Tokyo, um, started comparing what these um, clusters and, and what the connectivity in general looked like uh, with anesthesia and without anesthesia. And there are some very substantial differences. This has been uh, shown in the rodent literature already. There's even a little bit of human data. Um, what you find is, in general, the cortical cortical connectivity is just weaker in the anesthetized animals, but the actual coefficients kind of scale uniformly everywhere. So it's just like a subdued version. And what that boils down to is you just have to average a lot longer if you want to make good functional connectivity maps. But any circuit that goes through the thalamus, which is a whole lot of the circuitry, those circuits are all very substantially altered by anesthesia. And that's kind of what this plot shows, the correlation between the, the functional connectivity um, strengths uh, in the awake and, and the anesthetized state. And of course, it depends on what anesthesia you use as well. So inspired by uh, Afonso Silva's group, uh, who had initially started doing this 10 years ago now at NIH and then um, continuing on at Pittsburgh, we decided really we better move to, to awake marmosets. The first thing we did was have Blaine Chronic design as a absolutely kick-ass gradient coil, which was higher performance than anything that was available um, from Magnex or Brooker. Um, very high duty cycle, it's 15 centimeter diameter. It's a little bit bigger than their commercial offerings. Um, it takes 700 volts um, and um, produces 400 millitesla per meter with the IECO 400 amp uh, amplifiers that we have, uh, which are very you know, high power for a small animal imaging system. Um, so this is a very trick gradient coil. It's got all kinds of uh, higher order shims in it and everything to allow us to do really nice uh, EPI. Uh, then Kyle's group designed the animal holders and the RF coils and everything. Uh, the trick was, you know, a lot of these animals have chambers on their heads that allow us to do optogenetics or dreads or electrophysiology or microstimulation. Um, so we have to accommodate that in the design of this. Um, we have a zipper tube to reward the animal for, you know, staying still or for doing a task. We have a camera, a non-magnetic camera, very expensive German camera that cost $12,000, absolutely ridiculous, um, to make sure these animals aren't moving uh, and that their eyes are staying open because they like to fall asleep if they're not engaged. Uh, and we're able to keep the motion down to under 50 microns and under a tenth of a degree uh, with this setup. This is the RF coil, I won't dwell on it. It's actually in two parts that actually pivot and come together. We've moved on from this design, so I won't really dwell, but you know, every coil gets characterized for its temporal SNR, uh, for its decoupling and so on. Um, so this is all from Kyle Gilbert's group. Uh, it's a bit more detail um, of what this looks like. So there are pins in the RF coil that immobilize the chamber that is attached to the head of the animal. So you can see an image here. We filled um, the grid with gel um, so that we can figure out stereotactic coordinates, for example. 
uh, in relation to a grid that is put into the chamber. So we know exactly where to do our surgeries and, and where to stick our electrodes and so on. Um, we can use these as a guide for electrophysiology. So these are laminar recordings from uh, one particular penetration made in one of these areas. Uh, when you add all this hardware on top of, a, of an animal's head, whether it's a mouse or a marmoset, uh, you start to get susceptibility problems. And we've spent a lot of effort putting gels and things in, in these um, to be able to do susceptibility matching so that you don't have the kinds of dropouts that you see here. Instead, you get these nice whole brain images. So this is what API looks like at 500 microns. Um, for fMRI in a awake marmoset. And you can extract all these lovely brain networks that I won't dwell at. Uh, these are from uh, three different monkeys, but you can see that they're, you know, they're very similar across animals. And you, it, it makes a big difference. You go from having to average 15 to 20 10 minute runs to being able to do these things in you know, three or four runs. Uh, with the awake animal. But of course, we can do more than resting state. You can actually do awake animals and you can do tasks. That's kind of the whole point of doing awake animals. So we have a projector that we can bounce off a mirror and onto a screen at the bore of the front of the magnet. Um, our guys, our software group wrote real-time reconstruction code. So we are reconstructing the images and displaying them on the fly um, from the Brooker console. Um, and we're tracking motion in X, Y, and Z and rotations in real time. So we can make sure that the animal is A, comfortable and B, you know, not moving around. So that's very important. Um, so in this experiment, what we're doing is, is quite simple. We're showing action movie trailers in little patches in different parts of the visual field. And we're asking the animal to look at those um, trailers. Uh, so these are so-called saccadic eye movements. And uh, we can map that out. We can map them doing the task. Uh, of course, we reward them for doing the task. So they're also licking their sipper tube to get their reward. So we, that's a confound. Um, you can correct for it in your analysis, of course. Uh, so we can make maps of the visual uh, saccadic movements and as well as the reward movements. You can also have them do this in a free viewing manner. Um, so you just look at where they're, you know, we can track with a camera. So this is the camera. Using that camera, we're actually able to tell where on the screen they're looking. So we can put a scene up and then we can map where they're looking on that scene. And we can use that to look at things like uh, how marmosets process faces. And we can compare that to how humans process faces, for example. Uh, so these are sort of uh, visual saccadic areas. So this is humans. You do the exact same task of a human in the 70s scanner. Um, you know, it only takes like, a few runs to do this in humans. Uh, obviously, we don't have a licking reward in the humans, uh, but uh, we've separated that out anyway. So we can compare the visual saccadic areas in the marmoset and in the human, right? So these kinds of things are very important for, for higher order neuroscience. Um, frontal eye fields, which are you know, very well studied in humans and the cats, aren't actually very well characterized in marmosets. Um, so we actually use resting state fMRI to actually try to figure this out. Uh, you can put seeds in the superior colliculus and MT, which is a motion processing area. Um, and then of course you can also uh, look at saccadic eye movements, which drive this. And then you can get convergence areas for what we believe is the frontal eye field, for example. Uh, in fact, we have um, a joint uh, atlas, which is again, publicly available, uh, the Marmoset Functional Brain Connectivity Atlas. 
between Pittsburgh and us. And this uses uh, all the resting state awake marmoset data is available uh, online. You can go and you can stick a ROI anywhere you want in the brain and it will instantly calculate uh, the connectivity maps across the whole cortex. So our, our Martin Klassen and our uh, software group developed the software um, and it's, it's a free tool just like the Allen Brain Atlas for people to actually go and look at. So I've talked about phase processing circuitry um, uh, quickly, but uh, you know the take-home messages on this stuff are that you know translational models require careful validation of what you're actually looking at. Um, you know, there's a lot of work. You know, the beautiful work done at uh, Sick Kids and people uh, like at the Douglas and so on doing all this gorgeous anatomical phenotyping, uh, which, you know, we still aspire to do in many ways, uh, of brain areas that um, are thought to be important for certain things. Uh, but it's, you have to go beyond that um, when you're trying to actually look at translational research. You have to identify that those areas connect to the areas in the humans in the same way, and that they are actually engaged in a task in the same way. And that's really critical. That is the only way you can then say when you use some drug that you're postulating is going to improve memory or, or remove some aspect of autism or something like that. It's the only way you can truly say that because this worked in a mouse, it's going to work in a human. You have to have and demonstrate those homologies. An MRI, uh, I would argue, um, is a very powerful tool to establish those kinds of macro and mesoscale homologies uh, across model systems and into humans. Uh, and marmosets in particular are a, are a very viable preclinical model for an awful lot of neurological disorders um, involving frontal and prefrontal cortex. Uh, because that's, that area of cortex is, is an area that is underrepresented in mice, um, but it's critical to how humans operate. I mean, it's the front third of our brains, and it basically is a point of argument as to whether it exists uh, or not functionally and anatomically in mice. So uh, very important to be able to, to make these homologies. So with that, I'll just acknowledge uh, a lot of funding over many years that has uh, gone into um, building all this stuff, CFI, Brain Canada, our own CFREF, uh, my CIHR foundation grant, other people's CIHR foundation grants, CRC program, and so forth. Uh, so thanks very much. <laughs>